Hey guys, welcome back to the week 17 review of Zedunks NFL. This week I have a very special guest. You know him as Mr. Heat on YouTube. What's up, Tyler? What's going on? Yeah, man. So thank you for coming on the show. We got a lot to cover. Week 17 was very interesting because some teams were scraping and clawing, as you know, to get into this last playoff spot, whereas teams like the Chiefs and Packers were really just, you know, laid back like Mahomes' brother, you know? There wasn't a lot on the line for them. Uh, there's a lot that we could cover uh, with playoff discussions for future implications, and we'll get into all of that and more coming up. So right off the bat, the Cowboys squared off with the Giants in Week 17. Uh, the winner of this game could have won the NFC East had not Washington defeated Philly on Sunday night. What are your thoughts about how this game went down? Man, this game was definitely a battle. Um, it it could have it could have gone either way. It really could have. A lot of crucial mistakes at the very very end, but of course the whole game leads up to those. Yeah, I thought there was definitely a couple crucial mistakes. In the end of the fourth quarter, Andy Dalton got pressure up the middle and he forced, you know, an errant throw into the end zone, which is something you should never do, especially a veteran of his caliber, you know, just blindly throwing a duck over the middle. And, of course, it got intercepted by Xavier McKinney. So uh, that was just kind of a, a little cataclysm of what's happened the entire season for this Dallas offense. What do you think has gone wrong this season for that offense? Man, just not having Dak Prescott, you know, they were leading the league top five very well and offensively, um, Dallas Cowboys were, but then whenever Dak Prescott went down, you know, it, it hurt them a lot, and you know, Zeke hasn't really been producing like, you know, Ezekiel Elliott should, so I think that's, those two right there are definitely huge, huge killers for a, a team that needs offense with such a, a terrible defense. Yeah, that defense is, is dead last in rush defense, and uh, they are pretty good at pass defense, but it kind of doesn't make sense why. But then you, you realize the reason they're so good at stopping the pass is because everyone can run all day long on them. Like, it, it's not hard to stop the pass when nobody passes the ball against you. Uh, and let's go to the other side of the ball. Uh, the Giants, uh, Daniel Jones played very well in this game. He found Sterling Shepard for a couple of scores, even Dante Pettis for one. What are your thoughts on how Danny Dimes played in this matchup? Um, not to offend any, you know, Giants fans, but this is one of his best games he's played all season. And it was definitely the time to, you know, perform. But you kind of just need something out of him in in the whole season, you know what I mean? You need that consistency. Saquon Barkley should be back next season. As long as he stays healthy, that Giants team could be pr pretty deadly. Yeah, I think they have a lot of great pieces um, on the offense. They have Pro Bowler Evan Ingram, maybe upgrade receiver, but this is a great draft to get a great receiver with Devontae oh, yeah. Smith and, and Jamar Chase still on the board. Uh, and they're going to have a great spot. You know, that's one nice thing about missing the playoffs if you're in the NFC least. Uh, it's one of the few places where you could both contend for a playoff spot and then, you know, turn around and be in a top 10 draft pecking order. So mm -hmm. they're in a great spot to rebuild the, the weaker parts of that team. Uh, I I think O-line is a big issue for them, too. I think uh, Andrew Thomas has been a problem, but Nick Gates has done really well at center, and Shane Lemieux stepped up and completely replaced the second-rounder Will Hernandez this entire season. Uh, so that was really impressive to see those young pieces step up. Uh, and on the defensive side of the ball, I think their versatility on the back end with Jordan Love and Jabril Peppers and Logan Ryan, three guys who can all play corner safety or linebacker essentially, oh, yeah. really, really improve the defense. What do you have to say about that revamped New York defense? That defense is, is mostly young. I think, you know, that defensive line is actually pretty good. Um, you have, I believe, Leonard Williams on that defensive line. Now, they definitely need to look at maybe some other pieces in the draft. Um, but I, I want to go back to where you said about Andrew Thomas. He's been very underwhelming for such a guy that had so much potential. Fourth overall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, really? <laughs> like, if, I, if I'm putting my draft stock in a player, top five overall... Uh, I'm really, Especially offensive linemen. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of expecting to get like at least a little bit of a bang for, for my buck. And this goes for all first-rounders. Uh, I know sometimes we put a lot of pressure and expectations on young players, but I think a low bar 
for expectation should be, can we at least get a decent, doesn't have to be a great or good player, can we at least get a decent starter out of all our first round picks? But obviously that doesn't happen, and that's why we have seven rounds. But I totally agree with you. Like, what a, what a drop-off for him. All I know is I'm so glad uh, the Browns did not pick him up. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys definitely did better in, in, in that department for sure. And I thought your second round pick with Delpit was great. So we'll we'll get into into that selection. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say about this matchup? We both know these teams are headed home. And in this matchup, it just so happened that, you know, the Giants got the best of the Cowboys. Uh, anything else to say about it? No, both of these teams knew it was basically win or go home. They both fought. They fought hard. But in the end, it didn't really matter. But great game to watch. Great game to watch. Yeah, it was surprisingly like a very competitive game. And I was thoroughly entertained by Wade Gallman doing the splits on the football at the end of the game. He squeezed that between his cheeks pretty nicely. Um, <laughs> it was it was called it was called possession. So I guess we'll we'll hey, hey, whatever works, whatever works. We'll default to uh, the call on the field, but. Uh, that was a pretty suspect play, but I think nothing else would quite wrap up the NFC least like that. Um, Not at all. Yeah, moving on to the AFC North, uh, a very good division this year, sending three teams to the playoffs next week. Uh, the Ravens squared off in the Bengals in what was a must-win game because they did control their own fate. Uh, what are you thinking about how Lamar played in this matchup? Lamar played how Lamar is supposed to play, how people... You know, look at Lamar and be like, okay, he has to play like that. At the beginning of the season, Lamar didn't play like MVP Lamar. He's just now showing up, and if I'm a Ravens fan, I'm kind of worried a, a, a lot, actually, because can he stay consistent with that MVP Lamar? And if so, Marquise Brown has to show up, who is just now showing up, too. I think a big reason why his production dropped off this year is because the Ravens failed to pass the ball. They were number one in rushing offense, but they didn't do a good job of pushing the ball downfield at all. And Hollywood Brown, uh, Miles Boykin, Des Bryant, pretty much anyone on that roster that needed to catch the ball was, you know, suffered from that because Lamar kind of held him hostage in a way where if he wasn't throwing the ball downfield, he was just taking off with his legs. And sometimes that would work out. But you know, even though the Ravens made the playoffs, they're definitely not as strong as previous years. Do you agree? I agree 100%. Now, that secondary is pretty deadly. I'll admit that. Um, like I said, with these playoff teams, these playoff teams are, are going to know how to control Lamar Jackson. And that's the most thing is if I was Lamar or, you know, a fan of the Ravens, that's what I want to worry about is because you're not playing teams who don't know how to, you know, play against Lamar Jackson now. Lamar Jackson in the next couple of years is honestly not going to be good. I mean, it's, I'm just going to keep it real honest. He's going to get figured out. His legs are going to get more old, and it's it's not going to go out well, I feel like, for that Ravens yeah, franchise. Yeah. he's It's got to take a toll on him. You know, all those hits he's taken, like some of the shots he takes in games are, you know, brutal, but above all else, they're unnecessary. Uh, watch a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson who rarely get injured. They slide. They know when to go down. They know when to protect mm -hmm. themselves. Lamar has this reckless abandon about him, which p people love. It is fantastic to watch him go go for gold every time. But sometimes it's just putting an unnecessary risk on your franchise QB if that is him, you know? Oh, yeah. It's going to hurt him in the future. It's really hard. It's really hard. Uh, let's go to the Bengals. Uh, they had Brandon Allen start this game, and it was you could have started a mop bucket under center in this one. Uh, it would have it would have had the same <laughs> result. Uh, that Ravens secondary just you know ate up on everything. Uh, they couldn't run the ball. They couldn't pass the ball. Uh, they really have good weapons though in the receivers, I believe. So I think when they address O line and get Burrow back next year, they'll be really in really good shape because Burrow had four 300 yard games you know, before his gruesome injury against Washington. So I think having Joe Burrow back in that offense with T. Higgins, A.J. Green, Tyler Boyd, I think that's a really good recipe for success. Do you? You know, I agree with you fully. Um, and I said this before, and I'll say it again. Joe Burrow is going to be a future Hall of Famer. And uh, the, the Cincinnati Bengals are really lucky to have him. In the next couple of years, take it, give it two or three years, the Bengals are going to be, it's going to be a four-man race in that, in that AFC North. 
Yeah, Joe Burrow did play amazing uh, this season, and I totally agree with you. I thought that they had a lot of young weapons step up in a big way, and I think that the O-line had a lot of reshuffling. Uh, they're still waiting to get value out of Billy Price. I mean, come on, man. He's a first-rounder. Jonah Williams, another first-rounder. They're just waiting for some of these picks to live up to the expectations set for them before. Uh, so maybe if that comes to fruition, they bolster that O-line. And uh, the defense is just an absolute mess. Injuries have been a big issue. But uh, there's not a lot to like in the corners because whether it's LaShawn Sims or William Jackson, the outside leverage is completely absent when covering receivers. Uh, it's been abysmal, and they can't get to the quarterback. So I don't know where the Bengals go, but I don't see them being good for, for quite some time. Uh, I think a full rebuild is an effect uh, still for Cincinnati. So uh, in my opinion, Cincinnati is going to have to rebuild for quite some time. What would you say about that? Um, I'm going to slightly disagree with you right there. I think, I think you know, they get Joe Burrow back. He becomes healthy, and he does what he needs to do. You know, they get Joe Mixon back. They get, you know, some draft pieces on that offensive line. Um, they still have Geno Atkins. Um, they got rid of the crybaby and Carlos Dunlap, so that's going to help their, you know, their locker room out and their attitude out. Um, I, the, 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 second, the secondary, yes, does need some help. Um, I, I agree with you on that. Linebackers can, can play. I think, I think they're around the corner, but I'm talking like two or three years around the corner from competing. For, for a playoff spot well here's my issue um i laid out all the benefits and how i do believe in the offense but there's more than one phase to the game and cincinnati's just so behind the eight ball on that defensive side of the ball it's really hard for me to put any stock in them you know relatively soon like even in the next two to three years i think that defense is going to require some more time and while joe burrow has what it takes uh, it's possible he can overcome that obstacle, but that's the reason why I can't buy into the rebuild soon, you know? Yeah, I, I, I totally uh, understand that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just hard. Uh, talk about buying into a rebuild. Uh, Kevin Stefanski came into Cleveland as a first-year head coach, and not only did he change their season around, their franchise around, but he reinvigorated the city of Cleveland and the community of Cleveland with a sense of winning, a sense of success. He changed the entire culture, and you can't underappreciate what he did because not only is he successful, but he's actually changing like more than just the game. You know, as a huge Browns fan myself, I love it. I mean, this is what this is what we've been missing. I mean, honestly, we, we haven't had a solid coach. We haven't had somebody who can come and change the culture. And, you know, Kevin Stefanski comes in and, and changes that 100%. And not only that, but I definitely see him and Baker being the possibility next Sean Payton, Drew Brees, next Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, you know, the Mike Tomlin, Big Ben, just the head coach and the quarterback connection that lasts for both of their careers. You know what I mean? I definitely could see that them being the next two. I, I can't get there with you, but uh, I can definitely give credit where due. Uh, Baker has been streaky at points in the season, and throughout the middle, he was at times pedestrian, but he's really pulled it around, came out on fire, and you could see the emphatic energy within him when he rushed for that, when he scrambled for that first down at the end of the game to seal it. You could just see, like, he, he pumped his fist, and, and you knew that he was... He was proud of what he did, and the city of Cleveland was behind him. You know, it was it was a really powerful moment seeing Baker Mayfield kind of clinch something that hadn't been done in 18 years. Oh yeah, 100. percent You know, here's the thing about you know Cleveland Stadium. It may be a limited amount of people, but you wouldn't even realize. And right there is one of those moments you would not even realize. It it did seem very loud, and I know sometimes. You know, the TV tricks us this year where, like, they put in, like, the applause or, like, the crowd noises. But I think a lot of that sound for that game, especially when he wrapped it up, was very real and very genuine, you know? Uh, I could feel the energy. That's that's my take on it. I could feel the pride that Cleveland is beaming with. And I got to say, their future does look bright despite what happens in this playoffs. Um, Speaking of playoffs, the Steelers were the team that they faced in this one. They did not have Big Ben. They did not have TJ Watt. They did start a lot of starters, but it was not, you know, the entire cast and crew. Uh, how do you think about Mason Rudolph's game? Mason Rudolph actually played phenomenal. It was kind of weird because it seemed like they didn't have, have Mason Rudolph on a leash. Kind of like they do, they have had Big Ben this year. So I definitely feel like Mason Rudolph 
played very, very, very well for, you know, the situation he was put in. Yeah, it was it was wild to me that, you know, Randy Fickner continued to call the same reservoir of two, three plays throughout the season. Uh, it gets really frustrating when you have guys like Chase Claypool and Deontay Johnson and Juju Smith-Schuster when they're not dropping the ball. Uh, when they can show that they make plays, they can win one-on-ones, they can get vertical, it really puzzles you as to why the Steelers have played so pedestrian on offense this year. And if you're a Steelers fan, how worried should you be about that anemic offense headed into the postseason? Oh, I'm worried. Um, if I'm a Steelers fan, you know, it's it's either, in my opinion, one and done, or, you know, second round exit, if I'm a Steelers fan. I'd there's a lot of things that need to change and need to change quick. Uh, one being Big Ben needs to get off that leash that he's on and definitely throw the ball downfield. Like you have Chase Claypool, who's going to be the best wide receiver in that AFC North in the next two years. Yeah, it's it's really wild to me how you know they're not utilizing the pieces they have. Juju is probably going to walk this off season. He can go dance somewhere else for all I care. And I'm not like a Juju hater, uh, but just like. You know, he can do what he wants, but when you're dropping passes, like, you know, stop flexing. Like, you're not impressing anybody. Uh, I want to see production over anything else, and uh, you can do whatever the heck you want in your free time, but, you know, show up to play. You know, that's what you're paid to do, and he does a lot of good off and on the field, has a lot of fun, but make sure that your production is still there among all those, you know, shenanigans. That's what I would say. You can't can't dance on the opposing team's field and then – and then lose like that, especially versus a team like Cincinnati. That's pretty embarrassing. Yeah, he, he got laid out too. <laughs> yeah. Von, Von Bell definitely hung out his dirty yeah. laundry. You got you got to sure. make him pay for all that TikTok. Yeah, you got to put him on blast, you know, like Tory Lanes. You got to put him on blast. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how it goes. Uh, the Steelers' defense leads the NFL in sacks after the season concluded. They've had phenomenal year by T.J. Watt. And the Browns on the other side of the ball have had a phenomenal year by Miles Garrett, who missed a couple games. Uh, do you think that these two are the final candidates for Defensive Player of the Year? I don't. Um, Aaron Donald is obviously a guy that is going to be in that conversation. Um, and you know, I don't. A lot of the cornerbacks, a lot of state secondary, don't get Defensive Player of the Year. Besides last year, which Stephon Gilmore was phenomenal and got it. Like, he had to be phenomenal to get it, though. I think it's between T.J. Watt, Miles Garrett, and Aaron Donald. That's in- that, Yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. Um, In my opinion, I think T.J. Watt's going to get it just because of how versatile he is. Um, he's a great pass rusher. But additionally, like, just watch how he, he stops the uh, lateral run game. Uh, he, that guy whips into the backfield like the Tasmanian devil and can wrap up running backs like bef- before they even oh, get yeah. going. Um, I really haven't seen a player of his size that's that fast since his brother JJ. I think he plays way bigger than his size, but additionally, he has really quick feet and that footwork shows off when he's able to like run around defenders but also make tackles in the backfield. So for that reason, I think that TJ Watt's going to be defensive player of the year. I, I have to agree with you on that, and it's it's only going to get scarier for offensive line next year when J.J. Watt walks off the Texans, takes a huge pay cut to go play with both of his brothers in Pittsburgh. You think that, uh, wait, Steelers play uh, the Browns this week in the wild card, correct? Yes. Um, I know <laughs> I know you're a Browns fan. Uh, how do you think that uh, T.J. Watt is going to shake Baker Mayfield? T.J. Watt is coming off fresh f- fresh legs. You know, he got a, he got a week off. He's going to have fresh legs. Um, you know, we have a very good offensive line in Cleveland. Of course, we have one of our pro bowlers, Drew Batonio, out with COVID. We have, you know, our head coach out with COVID. And we have multiple pieces out with COVID. But, you know, TJ Watt is definitely going to, you know, make his name known. And it's, it's no surprise, you know? Right. It's, it's expected. Like, you knew it was the terrain, you know, at some point, depending where you would go with it. Uh, something to look forward to but uh good job cleveland you finally did it the drought is over um the drought is over for buffalo for being the punchy bag of the afc east as uh darth vader uh bill belichick and uh jedi or you know whatever you call the the opposing side 
Tom Brady have split <laughs> Splitsville, and no longer is there a, ty- a tyranny in the AFC East. There is new ownership. There is new thriving teams. And it's a big reason why the AFC is so dominant this year. Well, what did you see in the Dolphins and Bills game? The Bills are special, man. And I think I think if anybody has a chance to beat, you know, Kansas City, who in my my opinion can def are, are definitely beatable, it's gonna be it's gonna be Buffalo. I think Buffalo has the best chance to beat that team. But not only beat that team, but kind of leave a leave a mark on that team. You know what I mean? Just I think I definitely think um the Buffalo Bills have the best chance to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Just just by the whole year. Yeah, that's that's interesting take because their offense, of course, can compete with Kansas City. They're two of the best passing offenses in the NFL, pretty much. Both top five. It's interesting, though, the defense, I would say, was suspect for Buffalo. But in the last couple weeks, I talked about this on the show last week, their defense went from 20-something to, like, 15th so they really did improve and their takeaways have increased which is always good for playoff football because you got to capitalize on mistakes Uh, so I think the Bills are definitely showing that they're not a flash in the pan they're built to win for a while Uh, going to the other side of the ball do you think Tua is the answer for the Dolphins at quarterback you know I started when he got drafted I I didn't think Tua and I've never thought Tua was that good I'm gonna be real honest with you um you know, the, the Dolphins get quite good draft picks is coming up. So I definitely think you got to give Tua like a year or two, you know, by himself, no Ryan Fitzpatrick, have him start and see where it goes. I I can't answer that question yet. I don't think so, but you never know. He, he could definitely come out and surprise a lot of people. Yeah. Um. Well, he, he'd have to surprise me because I'm right with you. I don't think he's shown me the flashes to be the franchise guy. Uh, maybe in a system he could be viable, but you know, if you're asking for you know a Mahomes-esque player, a Brady-esque player, that someone who could you know improve the level of players around him, I don't see it with Tua. And uh, they did just fire or Chan Gailey resigned. Sorry. Uh, you know, maybe he had to resign. We never know, like, the background on those details. But, you know, the play calling maybe was to blame for some of his stagnant play this year. And on two separate occasions, they benched him for Fitzpatrick, who I guarantee you would have kept come into this game to rescue the Dolphins if he had not been on the COVID list. So I really don't think you've solved your problem at quarterback when you're needing to sub in, you know, like a tag team quarterback. Like, in my mind... Yeah, it kind of made it worse. Why do you need, like, if you believe in plan A so much, why do you need plan B? You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I think I think this coming year, they get two first-round picks. You, know, you take advantage of those two first-round picks, and you you 100% just lead Tua in, and just kind of let kind of let Tua, see, like, kind of just let Tua show what he can do. You know what I mean? I, I think that's the best, you know, bet for the Dolphins, and go from there, really. Right. It is too early, of course. You have to give Tua at least one more season before you make a firm decision. Um, But all we have is the sample size from this season. So until we see more and he changes our minds, uh, I'm going to keep this opinion. Uh, And additionally, the Dolphins on the other side of the ball, uh, they lead the NFL, as the season concluded, in takeaways. Their turnover differential is top three. They are excellent at snatching the ball from the other team. And big credit to Xavier Howard, who racked up his 10th and league-leading interception on Sunday against the Bills. What do you have to say about that vaunted Dolphins defense? That Dolphins defense is very underrated. You know, you got Byron Jones. I mean, you said Xavier Howard. You know, you got uh, Cal Van Noy. You got Emmanuel Ogba on the defensive line. You got very, very underrated but really good defensive players on that team you gotta think about it those guys i just listed those are all their first years being on that team playing together i think you give them a couple or more years to gain some more chemistry and you're looking at a really deadly defense yeah you can tell that this new england defense is paralleled to a new england system uh, both in the personnel and the way they play. Brian Flores took a lot of discipline with him when he left New England, and he's instilled it in that defense. The Dolphins are, I think, number two in the league at fewest penalties per game, which makes complete sense that 
you know, you would get that infiltration into your entire personnel and staff. And additionally, I think that Flores instilled his defense with an opportunistic attitude where we might not have the flashiest names. We might not have the world beaters that everybody else has, but as a unit, we can collectively make big differences that help our team win. And that's the New England and the Patriot way. Oh, yeah. I 100% agree. Yeah, so it's it's definitely cool to see that parallel. Some people get mad at me for like calling, you know, Detroit or Miami other versions of New England, but you know, you stem from that coaching tree and Andy Reid has a massive coaching tree, so does Bill Belichick. So that's the way it goes and uh that's that's how it's always been. So it's really not that big of a deal. It's just rubbing influences off from other places. Uh speaking of other places, the Packers up north took on the Chicago Bears. This was a must-win game for Chicago. They didn't play like they needed to win, though. What do you think about what happened? Mitchell Trubisky, either the the Bears need to find a quarterback or they need or Trubisky needs help. I think more of that help is going to be coaching, finding a system for Mitchell Trubisky or bringing in a coach to to help him. You know what I mean? Uh, because if that's the guy they're going to be rolling with. He, he needs to prove that he's a guy that they need to be rolling with. And until that happens, I don't see the Bears going anywhere. Yeah, um, uncertainty at the quarterback position is a huge plague. And granted, Trubisky played really well the last quarter of the season, uh, but he really crashed back down to reality against the Packers defense, which isn't overly known to be shut down. Uh, but you just talk about the, the little things, uh, completing passes to Allen Robinson and Darnell Mooney. He missed both of them on wide open passes. You talk about just leading an effective play action that could set up a deep pass. He's, he underthrows a lot of balls. Uh, there's far too many examples this season where guys are running curl routes, deep ends, and Trubisky skips it to him like he's skipping stones on a river. I don't know what he's up to, uh, but, but he ain't playing quarterback. That's, that's for sure. Uh, David Montgomery, I think, is going to need to pick up the horse moving into the playoffs because I think he's realizing that without a, a, a substantial quarterback play, uh, running back becomes that much more important. Just look at Tennessee. So it's going to be interesting how the Bears attack in the playoffs. Uh, let's talk about the Packers offense, though. Devontae Adams and MVP, most likely Aaron Rodgers, col- collaborate for what is the best duo of 2020, in my opinion. What are your thoughts on this offense? It could be better, and, you know, if you actually think about it, if they didn't take Jordan Love, which was the stupidest pick by far in the, in the, in the draft, if they didn't take Jordan Love and they actually picked up somebody that could, they could use, this team could be a lot better, in my opinion. Um, but besides that and things you can't really go back on, Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams are two of, the, in my opinion, the, the best quarterback and the best receiver in the league right now. Um Special, special duo. Devontae Adams can do it all. Perfect wide receiver, in my opinion. Now, Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers. I mean, there's nothing much you can say about that. But Aaron Jones played amazing and has been playing amazing. Like, he should be, though. Now, can you break down a little bit of what do you mean when you say Devontae Adams is the perfect wide receiver? Um, So, basically, he has it all. You know, there's some there's some re- receivers who, are, who had that speed, like Tyreek Hill, or have that route running like Stephon Diggs, or just physical, kind of like in my opinion, DeAndre Hopkins is pretty physical. DK Metcalf physical. Um, you know, Devonte Adams can 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 do with that all. He can he can beat you in that one v one physical. Even in the in the doubles and triple teams, he's a lot of times in. His route running is gonna beat you off, and and speed is gonna beat you off those double teams. Um, and you know, being in poise. An attitude is everything for that guy, in my opinion. He's able to keep his composure on every catch. He, you know, he's he has good attitude on and off the field. Yeah, he really is the complete package, and you said it perfectly. While other receivers like your Allen Robinsons or your Stefan Diggs or your Tyree Kills all specialize in either physicality, speed, or route running. Devontae does all three, and he really maximizes the usage as an elite wide receiver, and for that reason, I think he's going to win Offensive Player of the Year. I can agree with that 100%. Yeah, it's either Devontae or Derrick Henry, but I come back to versatility. The same reason I think TJ Watt's going to get the nod over anybody else is because uh, not only is he elite at his position, but he's able to do multiple things 
at a very high level. I think versatility and availability equal value in the NFL. Yeah, 100%. A, a, lot, a lot of value. A lot of value. If you're able to do it all, it definitely speaks volume on your value on any team. Yeah, it's it's a huge asset for any coaching staff because it's it's one less thing they have to worry about in the ever changing landslide of pieces that, mm-hmm. you know, revolve in and out like a door in the New York Plaza. Uh, let's talk about revolving pieces. The Cardinals' quarterback situation became uh, surprisingly dicey against the Rams. The Rams knew that they would have John Wolford, but. I can't imagine that Cardinals fans were expecting the backup to step in so early and play such a big role in their loss to the Rams. This was a must-win game for both of these teams. What are your thoughts? I feel bad for the Cardinals. Um, you know, having having if Kyler Murray was in there, the game would have been a whole different game. Uh, but you know, he got injured. He got injured fairly quickly, and it basically changed the whole momentum right to LA Rams, especially. You know, you have a Rams defense with Aaron Donald and, you know, um, Jalen Ramsey. It's going to be hard for a quarterback, a backup quarterback, to come in and, and do work. Yeah, it's it's incredibly difficult. Uh, and right off the bat, Walford threw an interception to Jordan Hicks, and that ended up setting up the only points of the game for the Cardinals. They completely could not move the ball at all. And a majority of the game was their defense on their heels, while the Rams offense remained on the field for much longer than, you know, any any Cardinals fan should should feel happy about. Uh, how much hope should the Cardinals have in their team moving forward? Is this a season where you can learn and improve or does this show more red flags? This is a season where you can you can learn and improve. Um, they have very good secondary in my opinion. Um, that defensive line needs to get quite a bit of better quite a bit better um, but defensive ends this is a, a pretty a pretty heavy defensive end draft in my opinion like more late rounds so I definitely think they can take advantage of that yeah I'd love to see them pair Hassan Riddick with a great edge rusher that would be cool to see because uh, Riddick he was a first rounder but he wasn't really panning up to expectations and then all of a sudden this season I think he totaled like 12 sacks so congrats to him for stepping up and actually producing the value they drafted him for and on the back end you got Patrick Peterson who in my opinion has kind of lost a step he's a little older he's a veteran uh he's still to be respected of course uh, but in my eyes Byron Murphy needs needs to be the guy moving forward and Buda Baker is a phenomenal safety so I think the Cardinals have an up-and-coming defense that maybe next year could mimic the Dolphins Oh yeah, I 100% agree. Young, so young again. Young's a great a great word to use though because it's be- it's better than old. You'd rather have a regime incoming than outgoing, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah. Uh, and the Rams, they they don't do well at maintaining players because they sign huge contracts and they can't maintain the rest of the team. When you get guys like, uh, you know. Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, uh, it really lacks cap room for anyone else on that team. And given how much they're paying Jared Goff, do you think they should go in a different direction at quarterback? That's a good question. Going different, it's gonna it's gonna be a risky. It's gonna be a risky. They can either go both ways. If they do, they need to maybe start thinking about a rebuild process. But I don't know. Jared Jared Goff is definitely not a bad quarterback. Um, if they do go with somebody, I. Definitely think it would be somebody from a draft. Kind of like the Packers picked up Jordan Love because they were maybe thinking about going in a direction like that. If they're going to, I think Rams have to pick up somebody in the draft. Yeah, um, and Goff might be serviceable, adequate for the next you know year, uh, but I seriously think his production is, is questionable, streaky at best. And if you plan to be a perennial contender with that, elite number one defense you need an offense to at least pick up the slack just a little bit not not crazy just a little bit but uh this game definitely was a haymaker to all the cardinals fans because i think it would have been very different with kyler murray in uh but the rams could make the same case you know golf had a thumb injury and who knows he could add he could have had a great game he could have come out and you know lit up the world but the rams are moving into the playoffs and uh that's just how it went um, and we speak of the playoffs, Washington 
they finally clinched it uh, since 2015. Uh, it had been a quite a while. They uh, beat the Eagles in what was a very questionable tank job in the fourth quarter. What are your thoughts on how the NFC Least Showdown went down? Very dramatic. Uh, I know there was a lot of drama, a lot of uh, words spoken from more of the you know the the Giants side about this game than any other team. You know, and I, I don't blame them. You know, you pull Jalen Hurts out in the fourth quarter for a, and don't even put Carson Wentz in. It's kind of an obvious throw, but in in my opinion, you know, why not? The Eagles, they're not going to make the playoffs. You definitely don't want you definitely don't want possibility Cowboys fans in the playoffs. So why not throw it? Get yourself a better draft pick, and move on. You know what I mean? That, that they got to move on very quickly. Yeah, the Giants fans were they were only mad because this means that like they didn't make the playoffs. But oh, yeah. you know, just just a suggestion, New York, you know, maybe win more than six games next year and you won't need someone else to do your do your work for you. Um, if you win seven, I, you're good. <laughs> uh, maybe even maybe even aim higher than seven. Uh all I can think about is that meme where uh, Squidward's looking out his window and Patrick and Spongebob are running with their hands up uh, down there. And I just see uh, Tua and the Dolphins looking out that, that sad window at Washington and Chicago getting in at 7-9 and nine and 8-8. Eight and eight. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's so sad, man. It's a, I, I feel bad for Dolphins fans. 10 wins, and they expanded the, the pool to seven teams, and you still missed the playoffs. How? How? Like, that's that's wild to me. Like, I don't know how that happens. Like, in recent memory, a 10-team, a 10 10-win ten team po- yeah, possibly misses, you know, a six-spot playoff pool. But expanding it to seven, that's where a 10-spot would go. I, I have not seen a team with that good of a record miss the playoffs in a very long time. Uh, and on the other side of that coin, in the NFC, I haven't seen teams with that bad of a record Two of them ha- aren't even better than 500 are taking up two spots in that pool. So um, that's that's really interesting to me. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, let's talk about that Washington pass rush, though. Uh, Chase Young's probably going to win Defensive Rookie of the Year, and Montez Sweat looks phenomenal, leading the team in sacks. Uh, what about that Washington defensive front makes them so hungry? They're all young. You know, the, the, you got to think about De'Aaron Payne's pretty young. He just got drafted a few years ago. Montez, Montez Sweat was drafted 2019 draft. Chase Young. These are all guys who, you know, obviously knows that the reason they're winning games is because of them. That defensive line is very, very strong. It's very, very versatile all across the board. Um, and they're only getting started. This is their first year playing together. They're only getting started. It's going to be a pretty scary sight to see what Washington can build up. Yeah, and I'd say the best part about this defensive front, of course it is the best part of this Washington football team, uh, but the best part about it is the selflessness of all the guys on that line. The reason Chase Young and Montez Sweat don't have TJ Watt or Aaron Donald level sacks is because they're stealing sacks from each other. There's five first rounders total on that defensive line if you include Kerrigan. And what's insane to me, Mm -hmm. what's insane to me is like they don't get jealous or they don't try to stat pad. Like in the Sunday night game, Nate Sudfeld fumbled the snap. Supposedly, Jason Kelsey missed the snap. He's just sabotaging at this point. And uh, yeah, and Montez Sweat, this was perfect. He reaches out and bonks the ball to Chase Young, who recovers it and runs for 10 yards. I'm like, that's the Washington football team season. That is what they've done. They've done it together. They've worked hard. And I'm kind of glad to see him rewarded, even though their record wasn't great. For a team like that, that has so many things hitting them from their coach, you know, having, you know, having cancer to, you know, Alex Smith coming back, you know, it's, you, you got to play as a team. You know what I mean? You got to play as a team and they're doing it and they're doing it pretty well, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really impressive to see the comeback story. I think you have arguably your coach of the year and no debate comeback player of the year and Alex Smith and Ron Rivera. Uh, Watching Ron Rivera ring that cancer bell as he was finished treatments was very powerful. And I know the players respect the heck out of him and they just know that he's going to fight for them and that no matter what happens, they're just a family this season. And Alex Smith, 17 surgeries, and we never thought he'd play again. He could have died. 
he comes back and and he didn't put on a great season but he he led this team as well as he could and the adversity that they faced is unmatched i haven't seen a team overcome this much and then among a pandemic uh the washington football team out of all the teams in the nfc east like hats off to them like this is just the feel-good story of the year in my opinion 100 percent. i i'm excited to see what they can do yeah like even if they don't make any waves against the bucks next week like it is really exciting that they're just gonna have that you know that playoff spot uh do you think that that I know Chase Young said he was coming after Brady. Uh, I'm interested to see how they'll fare against, you know, a real contender in Tampa. Uh, do you think that, you know, they're going to rise to the occasion? When Chase Young says something, he means it. I definitely think they have a chance of beating Tampa. 100%. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the Dos Equis guy. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he definitely means it. If Chase Young way. says he's coming after Tom Brady, they, they better double-team Chase Young because he's coming after Tom Brady. Double team young, Allen Payne, Kerrigan, and Sweat are still there. Exactly. So, so it's gonna be they're gonna have some they're gonna have some problems <laughs> with that defensive line. So you gotta pick your poison. You really do. You're you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're Tampa. I think uh, I mean Brady's good at getting the ball out quick, but that's not Arians' system. That's not how Arians mm-hmm. likes to play. Arians wants Brady to like launch it deep to Godwin and, you know, Mike Tony Evans. Brown. But, yeah, Antonio Brown. Um, how how is Antonio Brown still in the NFL? I feel like uh, he was the cover athlete of Madden in nineteen, and uh, everything just went all haywire for him. Like that's just. Did I step into a time machine? How is Antonio Brown and Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski all still on the field today? No, I spoke about this before. I never, I never even doubted Antonio Brown would be back. Like I, I knew he'd be back. I, I knew he'd be back. I know he had whatever was going on or whatnot. But as soon as he started becoming quiet, he was working on himself. You could tell he was working on himself. I knew he'd be back, and I knew he'd put the same production level he put on when he left. Let's be honest here. He's playing phenomenal for coming back in, what, half half of the season? Over half. Yeah, they suspended him eight games this year. So Yeah, it, 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 and in the bye week. It's Antonio Brown, man. If, if, I, was, if I was Pittsburgh... I still prefer Antonio Brown over Juju Smith. Whoa, yeah, I mean, yeah, when this year's Juju, of course, yeah, you you, you can make that claim. Uh, but interesting enough, uh, Brady seems to have gotten, you know, I I I stress to say the word better, but he's playing a different type of football because in in Belichick's system, he had to do the short passes and it was very sy- systematic. But in Tampa Bay, I'm seeing Brady extend plays. Uh, kind of uncork it. I'm seeing him play good football, but it's not traditional Brady. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, you could tell at the beginning of the season he was kind of on a leash, kind of like Big Ben. Big Ben is still now. Right. But you could tell Bruce Arians has a lot of trust in Tom Brady and definitely lets Tom Brady kind of just play instead of just being that dink and dunk guy. That's what the that's what the Pittsburgh Pittsburgh needs to do. Get Big Ben off that leash. Let him basically be the play caller. Just like, in my opinion, Tampa Bay is doing with Tom Brady. Let him be the play caller. You have these weapons around you. Like, you, you literally have all these weapons around you. Both teams, by the way. Why why hold them on a leash? Why play dink and dunk? Let them let the ball fly. Let those wide receivers or tight ends make plays. And go win football games. You know what I mean? It's Yeah, I totally agree. That is a huge reason why I love watching Chase... Uh, chase young this year because he goes after it and also joe burrow like i think there's something to be said for young players because they don't have that sense of trepidation that these veterans might have uh lamar jackson going reckless you know you might love to see it it's not going to help him later but you know there's something said for just going after what you want in life and watching you know tom brady play with that young passion that you know he played well in new england but this is different I think this is very different because he's playing like he has a chip on his shoulder and he knows everybody's like whispering, whispering, like, oh, who made Belichick? Who made Bill? Um, who made Brady? But, you know, he's he's out there having fun. And young players like Burrow who can push the ball down the field and just not really, you know, put too much weight on the consequences are the ones that are going to make the biggest impression on the league. Yeah, I agree with that fully. I mean, Tom Brady definitely looks like he's having fun. Um you know, and it's, in my opinion, and I'm going to say it right now, Brady made Belichick. Yes, that system they were in, I think Brady's, I think Bill Belichick helped Brady, but I think at the end of the day, Brady 
made Belichick. I saw this graphic. Uh, it was on Instagram. Uh, Belichick's record without Brady, you know, on the Browns and Jets, and then Belichick's record with Brady. And there was a huge difference because when he was with Brady, that's pretty much when he compiled all his career wins. But without mm-hmm. Brady, he actually has a, a really poor losing record, which was eye-opening for me because I always thought Belichick made Brady. I thought he could plug in, you know, Stidham or Cam Newton. I, I thought... Belichick could really plug in anybody from the Empire, and they would still, you know, use the Death Star. It wasn't. It was surprising to me that that big of a drop off happened after Brady left, and this was not what I was expecting. I actually had a lot of uh, trust in Cam Newton coming into this year. Um, you know, I, I felt his hunger, and I just don't think that was the right system for him. I, um, I definitely think he can still do it. I just think he needs he needs a system where he's allowed to use his feet a little bit more. You know what I mean? You know what would be a good system for Cam Newton? Baltimore. I think that that system would work really well for him. Like where they want like a running team that could also do like play action and, and, and lay it deep. Like I think that would that would have been a great potential landing spot for him. Uh, but of course, <laughs> there's there's other factors. Um, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, how the league shook out this year. Because I wasn't expecting the AFC to be this this good and i think it all comes back to belichick and brady splitting up that you know divorce if you will call it i think opened the door for an overall more competitive nfl i agree i agree 100 percent. you know the, the buffalo bills can now can now lead that the division they're in like it, it just leads for a lot more teams and a lot more opportunities everywhere yeah, and you're probably happy the browns probably wouldn't be in the playoffs if the patriots were still you know thumb down the whole league oh yeah they probably we probably wouldn't actually yeah it's a whole butterfly effect where you know we see the ripples in the pond and you know everything's shaken up in a certain way um and it's opened the door for new regimes and new dynasties like mahomes and the chiefs who by the way i'm gonna call it right now the chiefs are gonna win the super bowl so don't get mad at me when it happens because mahomes is just too good you know (laughs) he he'll throw a 70 yard bomb and then he'll eat a victory steak and slather it in ketchup because that's the kind of baller he is. Um, I don't think the league should be afraid of the Chiefs turning into the Patriots because, first of all, Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes are such different people than Belichick and Brady. Most of all, they're more likable right off the bat. You know, they're not, like, scheming to, like, you know, they're not, like, evil. They're not, like... Like, shit, cheating, yeah. there's not yeah. that aura about them where they're like, they're up to no good. Like, no, there's, like, uh... <laughs> they're like you you uh, it's more of like uh you know they worked hard for what they had and you saw both those men Maho- uh, Mahomes and Andy Reid struggle in different points in their life you saw them hit the lows Andy Reid was kind of disgraced after his time in Philly which was really unfortunate because he did a really excellent job and then Mahomes was you know disgruntled when he slid in the draft because people doubted him they said he wasn't nearly as good as some of the other prospects in his class but you know you look back and seeing the pairing of these two you know you know it's it's good for the whole nfl in my opinion yeah i have to give a lot of credit to uh john dorsey though um you know previous gm of you know the chiefs and the browns who neither team will be where they're at without john dorsey you know he has a very very good rebuilding teams mindset and if i'm an eagles fan i'm excited for him to be the next gm because look at what he's made for the chiefs and the browns look at how well he's drafted for the chiefs and the browns obviously two playoff teams that are over 500 you know what i mean so if i'm an eagles fan i'm not really too worried about the past i'm you really need to worry about this future with uh especially coming up do you think the Eagles have enough pieces to rebuild right now? Um, here, I'm going to ask you a two-parter. One, can the Eagles rebuild right now? And part two, is Carson Wentz tradable? I'm going to answer that with both answers real quick. The Eagles are not rebuildable right okay. now if they want to trade Carson Wentz. And then here's a reason why. If they want to trade Carson Wentz, they have to pay Carson Wentz $28 million. All right, but if they want to hold nice. on to Carson Wentz and not trade him, they are rebuildable right now because they don't have to pay that twenty-eight million dollars that they had to owe him for nothing. You know what I mean? To, to basically trade. So 
Yes, they're rebuildable right now, but that's only if they keep Carson Wentz. If they want to get rid of Carson Wentz, then they're not going to be rebuildable, There's at least at least next year. That's fascinating to me because, you know, I know rebuilds take time, but to hear you say, like, Wentz is the linchpin, um, I think that's true. But Philly fans, you know, they're kind of impatient. You know, they're the type of fan base that'll throw snowballs at Santa, so they're really not super classy <laughs> yeah, at certain, did you? <laughs> at certain junctures in time. But, but, but... Uh, a couple of my friends are Eagles fans, and, and they're nice people, but they're a little unrealistic in what they think a rebuild is. Like, one of my friends is is assuming that the Eagles can rebuild all in this offseason, and I'm like, no, 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 my friend. As a Jags fan, I can tell you firsthand, this takes time. It takes an awful lot of time and patience because you're not going to get everything done, you know, in one trip. Like, my dad used to tell me whenever we'd be doing chores in the house or having to do laundry or lift stuff, I would always try to jumble it all in my arms and, you know, some stuff would fall. Oh, yeah. Like a, 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 a soccer grocery team is, would... Groceries and you yeah, got groceries yeah you got yeah all the and, groceries man all the all of them <laughs> yeah dude i'd like i'd like my my fingers will bend back all natural like i'm spider-man but it hurt really <laughs> bad and, and it's okay though um, but my dad would just tell me just take two trips i'm like no dad i have to do it in one I yeah have it to has get to it get done. it done it all in one <laughs> and and really that's what eagles fans are, are complaining to like the gm about they're like dorsey we have to do it now and dorsey's like listen guys it's gonna be a lot easier for everybody if you go to the car come in the house and do it a couple times then we'll be done but you can't all do it at once or you risk breaking the eggs so i definitely know a lot of eagles fans are excited for john dorsey knowing what he's able to do with team to do with teams in the past they just the time is all they need yeah and you know a little bit of patience so uh, at the end of the at the end of the episode, I asked my guests, "What's one thing that surprised you most this week?" So, out of the whole week seventeen slate, is there anything that popped out to you? Uh, yeah, that Dolphins and Giants game, man. You know, it could have went either way till the final second. Like it, it was so there was so much going on in that game. That game was up for so much grabs. There was a lot on that game. If if, if you know, Eagles would have won. I I definitely think yeah. Uh, the Cowboys and Giants game was probably my biggest surprise. And yeah, seeing Wayne Gallman do that. The, 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 <laughs> that the, wild. The, the butt, whatever it's called. I don't even know what to do. Yeah, the, the butt recovery. So Sanchez had the butt fumble. This is the butt recovery. So oh, yeah. that's what it's gonna. That's what it's gonna be known for. The thing that surprised me most was the Dolphins. This was a must-win game for them, and they haven't been competitive since I don't know. Tannehill was still on their roster, and they came out and they got eviscerated by the Bills, who didn't even start their starters in the second through fourth quarters. So, uh, really disappointing to see how you know Miami feared fared in that game. But I think it's for the best. Because like the Eagles fans and the grocery kid and all of us, we all just want to get it done in one trip. But sometimes you got to be mature and, you know, the parents going to tell you take more than one trip. It's going to take mm-hmm. time. I think that's I think that's a big theme from this episode. A lot of change in life is gradual. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm-hmm. So you need to be prepared for that. You know? Yeah. For Eagles fans, all I can say is you look at the Cleveland Browns from 0-16 and then John Dorsey comes in in two years and makes them a positive team, which we barely missed the playoffs last year, to, to make the playoffs in three years. You know what I mean? That's that's all John Dorsey basically right there. That's what they need to look at and be like, damn, they made that 0-16 team to a playoff team in three years? Like, we, we need to trust this GM. And that's a quick rebuild, like three years. So, like, big kudos to, to John Dorsey. That's phenomenal. And uh, that's really smart that, like, you can note, like, who are the big move makers in the background because everyone's going to give credit to the head coach and, you know, the coordinators, but uh, it's the higher ups who make a, a lot of the culture changes in these newer teams. So uh, it's definitely something to think about. Uh, so thanks guys for listening. This was the week 17 review. Uh, Tyler, is there anything left to say to the listeners from your end? Uh, I have nothing. Just, I appreciate you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on. I thought this was an awesome conversation, and uh, I'll get back to another episode next week. So, guys, have a great week. I appreciate if you stuck along, stuck with me this long. Uh, Thank you, and have a great week.